Okay, let's get back to it. So um, now that we've seen how to use, set up a simple system, use some of these sum objects, um, let's create a sum object. And I think my idea here is to show you how to create a simple sum object and we're gonna build it up a little bit um, as we go. So if you know how to build one, even if you're not gonna be building one, you'll still be able to understand the other sim objects that you're interacting with in the system and understand when you try to uh, modify one. So first, I wanna briefly say, um, Gem5 has coding guidelines and it's important for you to follow these coding guidelines even when you're just working on your own. Um, you know, partially because uh, it's just good practice and your code will look better. But um, also, you know, the other thing is we want to encourage you to, any changes you make, push them to the main line and to be a part of the community as a contributor. And if you follow the guide, style guidelines as you start, you won't have a million reviews saying like your style's wrong, your style's wrong, your style's wrong. That's the easiest review to give. Reviewers love to give that review of fix your style because you can just look at it and easily review. Style's wrong. Um, so try not to do that. Um, when, you write, when you compile Gen5 for the first time, it asks if you want to install the style guide. And it gets automatically installed either in your git rc, git config, or your material config file. Um, and then whenever you try to commit anything, it errors if you try to commit um, with style problems. So don't ignore those style errors. Uh, um, you know, also use good development practices. Historically, we used Mercurial queues. Now we're moving to Git, so use Git branches, I guess. I'm not a Git expert. Andreas will talk more about that this afternoon. Um, okay, so adding a new sim object. So we're gonna go through five steps. We're going to create a Python class, or create the sim object description file implement the C++ for the object, register the sim object and the C++ file so it gets built with scons, build Gem5, and then create a config script that uses this sim object. Um, okay, so let's keep going. Um, let's make a new directory in source. Since we're going to be at adding a new sim object, we need to do this in source. So we're going to do source HPCA tutorial. Um, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to create the sim object description file. So we're going to call this, we're going to call our sim object hello object. So we're going to create a file, hello object um, dot py. And the sim object description file is um, camel kits, is the, um, what we usually do. Um, now this is kind of a Python file. It is interpreted via a Python interpreter, but there's some guidelines around it and it's more of this sim object description file um, than just a general Python file. So what you start out is um, from m5.params, import star, import all the parameter things, and from m 5sim object import so if we need to um, import other sim objects, um, you need that second line. So we're going to define a Python class. Um, hello object. And it's going to inherit from sim object. So this is now our, the name of our sim object that we're creating, hello object. And it is a sim object. Then we have two more lines that we need. Um, so these two lines, this type says what the C++ um, class name is that this that um, implements this sim object. So we're going to create a C++ object called hello object. It's almost always exactly the same as the name of your sim object. There are a few specific cases where it's not, but 
I can't imagine why in anything you were doing, you would want to change that. The other thing is what header file is this type defined in, and that header file is going to be hello underscore object of HH. All these C and C++ files um, are all lowercase with underscores. So let's create that header file. Hello object.hh. So the first thing we're going to do is in all of these header files, we guard to make sure they're not included multiple times because C++ is wonderful. Um, What we usually do to guard here is the full path to the um, file and then the file name. Underscore, underscore, okay. If it's not defined, define it. And then end it. Um, so then we need to include two files. We're going to include the sim object file. Since we're inheriting from sim object, we have to include that file. And the other file we're going to include is params hello object.hh. This file is automatically created from that Python sim object description file. So when scans runs, it sees the Python sim object description file and creates a params slash whatever the name of the sim object is, .hh. And we'll see what's in this um, in a minute. So with these two, we now define our class. Hello object. It is a sim object. And then we just need to find a um, constructor. It takes a single parameter. And this parameter is the hello object params. And this parameter is defined in this header file automatically. And again, it's automatically created from that Python description file. So that's all we need to do here have a full implementation of a sim object, or full definition of a sim object, not implementation. Questions? OK, so let's implement the sim object. Hello object.cc. By the way, we use cc for C++, for C++ files and hh for C++ headers. I think it's true that everything is in C++ in source. Yes, it should be. Other than the Swig stuff. Um, so in our um, C uh, definition file, we're going to include that header that we just created. So we're going to include that hello object at HH. Um, and this is always the first thing, well, just about the first thing you include. Um, and then we are going to define the constructor. So we have to call the sim object constructor as well with that same params variable. And then let's just print hello world here. So for now, we'll use C out, and we'll see a better way to do it here in a minute. IO stream. Right. 
So now we've um, implemented the whole sim object, but we need to do one more function in this file. This is one that is often forgotten and gives really weird errors. Um, we need to define this uh, create function of the hello object param. So this params object, which is automatically created in that header file I've been talking about, has a single function create, which has not been defined. So you have to define this function yourself. And this create returns a hello object. So we're going to simply return a new hello object. Like this. So when you call M5 instantiate, M5 instantiate walks through all these params objects, which is what you're actually creating in Python. It calls all of their creates, which then calls the constructor with the parameter. So this is why you can't change the parameters after you call M5 instantiate. Questions? If you don't define this, um, you get a linker error saying create function doesn't exist. So if you ever see that, you know you forgot to find a create function somewhere. Um, these are almost always, you'll find them at the bottoms of the sim object implementation files. Almost always. Um, and you can do more complicated things here, but there aren't very many examples of that. Okay, so then there's uh, one more thing we need to do. The next step was to register the sim object in the C++ file. So to do this, we're going to create a scon script file in this directory. And be careful that C is capital. Capital S, capital C, on script. Um, I think the scons people tried to make this like as easy as possible to mess up. Um, all right, so we're gonna edit this file. And this is, this file is Python, but it's a really, really weird Python. Um, so we need to import star, um, which imports a bunch of functions that we can call. We're going to declare our sim object and say this hello world py file has sim objects in it. And then we are going to say that hello object.cc is a source file. So we need to compile that file. Um, so, if you ever add a CC file, you need to come in and add it to the Sconscript file in that directory um, for it to compile. Questions? No? All right, now we can rebuild uh, Gem5. Oh. Sorry. I should have been hello object. I'm not sure what I was doing there. Cool, so you recompile Gen 5, which should only take a moment. Okay. It links. All right, cool. So, you now have another sim object in Gen 5. So the next thing, you have to create a uh, configuration script that uses the sim object. So let's create config HPCA tutorial hello run.py. I think that's what I called it. Yep. Okay, so 
And this file, we're going to again import M5, just like um, in our simple.py from m5.objects, import star, objects. We're going to first create a root. We're going to say root dot hello. Hello equals hello object. So we're going to create this simple. We're going to instantiate our hello object. Call m5 instantiate. Um, print. That. And then simulate. Okay, so this is our entire run script. You will never see a simpler run script in Gym 5. How many lines is that? Eight. Lots of curious type things. Questions? So um, it's Python, so it's doc typed. So you can at any time add extra parameters, like a, a extra members to things. So I mean, it has to be a member of root somehow. Um, but this could be called anything. I could also call like it's just a variable name. Um, What's important is to use the sim object that we um, create. Well, you have to do this step. Hmm? You have to add. Yeah, you, you, you have to add it to root. Everything has to be a child of root. Um, previously, um, we said, like, I think in our previous one we had system equals system. And this was just a different way to do the same thing. This also makes it a child. Um, you could also, instead of doing full system false there, you can say root dot full system equals false. Um, so before you call m5 instantiate, it doesn't matter if you pass any of these parameters as parameters to the constructor or just set them as members of the classes. Um, so sometimes it makes more sense to do one way or the other. Any other questions? Okay, so we can now run this. I'm good with one typo every time I do this. So we get. Hello world from a sim object before beginning the simulation. So this was during if I instantiate, we printed out this because that was print in the constructor. So cool. Um, questions on this? I'm running ahead of myself, so we're doing good on time. Maybe the fault lies with you. You're not asking enough questions. <laughs> Board, are these examples too simple? I guess so. Yeah. So this hello object is kind of living by itself. It's not really interacting with anything. Yeah, it's not interacting with anything at all. Okay. Um, and in fact, like you see, we exited at tick um, negative one of a UN64 um, because the event driven simulation just looked at the event queue. There was nothing on the event queue, so it exited. 
it increased time to infinity and stopped. Because, you know, because simulate limit reached. That's why we exited it, since there was nothing on the event queue at all. Any other questions? But when we ran hello before, um, we ran simple. It actually exited at this pick because the binary called exit. So there was some event that was put on the event queue to exit the simulation. Any other questions? We'll do one more little section before the break. I'll take about 10 minutes and we'll be done around the time. Nothing. So I'm not going to be discussing details of full system. There is um, partially because it's complicated. A, a lot of it is just you have to do X, Y, Z. You know, you have to do all this stuff. Uh, in the book, there's a part which covers some of it at a high level that has some scripts to forget the full system mode. Go ahead and ask, and yeah. if I'm going to talk about it later, I'll talk about it later. Yeah, in the SD mode, can we, I think we cannot run multi-threading, You can. We can. It's um, not the easiest thing in the world to do. We have to modify it? So um, in SD mode, to run multi-threaded, you can create multiple CPUs and create multiple workloads, set up binaries for multiple workloads, um, and then create threads. It, it, it's a similar thing. Um, Multi-process is pretty simple. If you're doing multi-threaded, um, it definitely works. Uh, and there's two different, in x86, there's two different ways you can do it. You can link your application to the M5 threads um, library, which is an implementation of pthreads that works in Gen5. Uh, you can find it at, uh, if you search M5 threads, I'm sure you'll find it. So you can link your pthreads application to that, and then it'll work. Or if you're on x86, if you're on an x86 host and simulating x86, um, Gem5 has the ability to run dynamically linked binaries. So you can actually link to pthreads, and I'm pretty sure things work. I haven't tested it, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm pretty sure uh, I'm pretty sure AMD internally is using it a lot, so it should work. The, you'd have to make some modifications to the scripts, the, the simple scripts that I have, but it should work. Yeah, I mean, we have to modify the script, and it's not like passing a parameter. Yeah, it's not as simple as passing a parameter. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, one more. Yeah. Um, so the first one is the DRM device package. Well, but, um, so what exactly does the address range thing? So the address range is... Um, so it said like 512 megabytes. So it was, set, it was setting up a range from 0 to 512 meg. Um, and that range is what we're using for system memory. You can have multiple ranges. So for instance, when you're doing full system mode in x86, you have to have a 512 megabyte gap for I.O., um, the top 512 megabytes in the first four gigabytes. So you have to have this gap. Um, I think it's 512. Anyway, um, so it ends up with multiple ranges if you go over four gigabytes. Or um, you might have one flat range of system memory, but then each memory controller might have different ranges that it's responsible for. And those ranges, we'll see when we do mem objects, end up propagating through the mem objects so the crossbars know where to send um, information. So this warning, um, you know, the device capacity is 8 gig, but I only set it to 512 meg. Um, so it might not make exact sense with which banks the requests are going to, for instance. So technically, um, well, I can just change the platform to 8 gigs. Yeah, it'll work just as well, but you better have 8 gigs on your platform. Uh, uh, you'll get an out-of-memory error, because it tries to map every all, the whole memory range. Yeah? I, I just want to understand the structure of that. So the root is also a SMR. I don't think root is a sim object. Root is actually a sim object. It is so a sim object. Anything that, that you can instantiate from Python is a sim object. Okay. Yeah, so root is special though. 
Um, if you look at um, the instantiate code, it looks, it finds the thing called root, the name root, and then starts instantiating things starting there through this object tree. So, and, and the, the previous example before creating some objects, uh, system was also a sim object, mm -hmm. but you didn't link it to, you didn't attach it or link it to roots in that case. So I did. I did, I just did it in a, in a way that's confusing. Um, that's something I should probably change, to be honest. So if you look at this, um, I could have done it. Anything you put in this, um, as these parameters to the constructor of root, you know, it, it's a Python trick. And they get put in a dictionary, and then that dictionary is expanded, and everything in there gets basically somewhere it looks like root system system. So I could have done it this way. Okay. No, uh, I, was, I was looking actually at the book, that's why. Um, the book, the simple example, you didn't do that. You just, you just immediately went system to the uh, system sub object. That's why you put Yeah, so. Right, you can do this, and then, you know, here I have the system defined up here. I could have defined root up at the top, too. I could have done root first. Um, the order that you define things in doesn't matter at all. All that matters is that it's defined before instantiate, or declared instantiated before instantiate. Okay. So let's quickly go through this next little thing, um, which I think I can do in 10 minutes. And then we'll be at a really nice stopping point for the break. So, um, if we look at that file we created, source, uh, HPCA, hello, object.cc. We use this uh, print here to print something. Now, this would just be terrible if everywhere in the code you had these print statements for debugging purposes. Now, partially because you'd have every time you want to debug something, you'd have to go through and add a million print statements, and partially because other people don't want to have your print statements in their code. So Gem5 has a really flexible um, way to do uh, debug output, and that's what you should always use um, if you need to print something from your code for debugging purposes. So um, what this looks like is we can define debug flags. So um, for instance, I'll go back. Um, if we run gem5, this simple, we can pass a debug flag as a parameter. Let's say the DRAM debug flag. I'm only looking at the first 50 lines. So when I pass the DRAM debug flag, now the system memory controller starts printing out a ton of debug information. Um, so over here you have the tick that it happened on, the object that created the debug, or that is trying to print the debug information, and then some kind of information. So at this tick, a request was scheduled immediately. Or this tick you got something for address 400, rank 0, bank 0, row 0. Um, there are lots and lots of debug flags. If you do gem5 minus minus debug help, it prints out all of the debug flags. Um, and there's a ton. And there are other cool things you can do with these debug flags as well. Um, you can put debug breaks. So if you're running GDB, you can breakpoint at some specific tick. Um, certain flags, when you want the debugging prints to start, what tick to start at, what tick to stop at, if you can change it to go to a file instead of standard out. Um, this debug ignore expression does something. I'm not really sure what. Um, but, uh, it's very powerful. So let's add a debug flag to replace that uh, print statement that we had before.
So to do this, you first need to declare the debug flag. So to do this, we're going to edit the scan script file, HPCA scan script, um, and declare a debug flag. We're going to call it hello in our scan script. So if you ever want to add a new debug flag to something, you can go into the scan script file and declare it like this. You can call it whatever you want. OK, so to use it, we can edit our um, hello object C file. Now, instead of including IO stream, we need to include debug. Uh, let me make sure I get this right. Hello.hh. So again, this is something that's automatically created for you. Um, this hello is whatever we call our debug flag. Um, this header file is automatically created. So then here, instead of doing standard C out, we can call dprintf. So this is just like dprintf, or just like printf, but with a debug flag. The first parameter here is the debug flag. So whenever hello is enabled, we will print at this dprintf, hello world from a sim object. And then you can pass additional parameters just like you would in any C format string. So you could say whatever you want. Anything you would do in a normal C format string, you can do here. Um, all right, so now we need to recompile. If we pass it, that's debug flag. Hello? And run. You see tick zero, this object that we call hello JSON, prints hello world from a symbol object. Whenever we want to print there. So that's how you do debugging in Gen 5. Questions on that? Okay, so let's quickly go through what we just did here. Um, hit the highlights again. See if there's any other questions. So we created this uh, hello object py file. Um, so these params we'll talk about more in a minute, but it has things like memory size, integers, latencies. Um, one of the next step we'll look at adding parameters. Um, then any objects that we're going to subclass we need to import. Or you can actually have these objects as parameters as well. And then, like I said, that's the C++ class name and the header file where we defined it, which is slightly different in this example. And we implemented a C++ object, um, the constructor of the single parameter. We did this, must define that. Then we created the scan script file <coughs> with all this information. Then we created our config script. Then we did debugging. I think there's, yep, cool. Um, and for, there's one other thing I wanted to say about debugging. Oh, yeah. Um, in the book, there's a bunch of other functions other than just dprintf that can be useful at different times. And in the book, it talks about each one of those and when they're useful and what kind of parameters it takes and uh, why you might want to use them. With that, questions on a simple sim object or jump out debugging? Or debug flags, at least. No? Okay, well, it's break time. Um, be back at 10.30, and we will talk about adding events to this sim object, adding parameters to the sim object, and making it a memory object, and actually hooking it up into the memory system.